Welcome to The Jungle, where we discuss social science and applications to business and society. My name is Doug Lepisto, and I'm co-founder of Sleeping Giant Capital and the Center for Principal Leadership and Business Strategy at Western Michigan University. Today, my guest is Dr. Chris Marquis. Dr. Marquis is the Sinyi Professor of Chinese Management at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. He's a world's expert on how organizations achieve a triple bottom line impact of environmental, social, and financial performance. He's also a leading expert on capitalism in China. We discuss his recent book, oh, and Markets, wow. The Communist Roots of the Chinese Enterprise. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Appreciate you, you, you coming, cheers. Um, Cheers. Really? Yeah, I don't have any any beverage with me, but I'll imaginary cheers. Uh, cheers. I I mean, I, I drink Rishi tea. It's my my perpetual goal. If I talk about it enough, I'm gonna try to manifest it to get Rishi okay. tea to be a, a a sponsor of the podcast, just because I'm such a huge a huge tea fan. Um, w- so, where is it? Where is it from? Rishi tea. I don't I don't know it. Actually. Wisconsin. So it's a it's an importer okay. from Wisconsin. They've got all the high end kind of. You know, it's kind of like that third wave of coffee it was the third wave of tea. Sure. And so you can get super snobby and, you know, but it's like wine and I don't really, I don't really drink alcohol. So this is kind of like, you know, you enjoy different types of, you know, wines, same thing as teas or coffees. Yeah, no, definitely. Beers. I mean, when, when I, when I spent time in China, um, yeah, the, the, the amount of thinking and and culture that goes around tea there is is really impressive like wine just exactly like you're saying so i'd love to start off with your with your bio so sure. you're the and and i'm going to mispronounce this the sinyi that's pretty good yeah sinyi the sinyi professor of chinese management at the university of cambridge judge school of business you've got an undergrad from notre dame Masters and MBA from Pittsburgh, PhD from uh, a, a great school, the University of Michigan. Just great academics produced from that institution. You know, really, I think scholars who are do, like we just talked about. You know, the Scott Sunshines and Adam Grants and folks like yourself that are paving new ways. So your research, this is from your your website now. It's always interesting to hear sure. how people have on the website <laughs> and then how they. It evolves in a, in a month. You know, research and teaching on how businesses can um, are creating a more resilient and sustainable capitalism by focusing on the elusive triple bottom line of environmental, social, and financial performance. So, and you you're an author uh, now, a, a recent award winning book, Better Business: How the B Corp Movement is Remaking Capitalism, and a new book that. I read, which was really outside of my comfort zone in terms of like interest <laughs> and like, and I loved it. Uh, Mao and markets, the communist roots of Chinese enterprise. Um, so you're at University of Cambridge. You were at Cornell. You you were previously at Harvard. So uh, how about you step back for us and maybe frame up how you approach these topics as a as a scholar, like you know for the. For the academic crowd that might listen to this, how would you how would you frame your understanding and your research and, and interest? Yeah, good question. Uh, and and I think you know uh, you know as an academic, I mean, the great thing is we can sort of pursue whatever we like or whatever we inter- are interested in. And you know what you described, you know, study of B Corps, study of sort of communist ideology in China seems like maybe different things in many ways. Um, but I think of them as actually, I'm really interested in sort of culture and particularly ways that actors, you know, buck the norms, uh, so to speak. And I think that, mm-hmm. you know, we have, um, you know, a variety of economic logics that guide the world that are embedded in policy that are embedded in just the way that we think about the world. So for instance, the better business book is really very much about, um, you know, how, you know, entrepreneurs can try to create new accountability, new governance systems that push against, you know, the dominant shareholder capitalism, um, 
idea that really dominates business around the world, particularly uh, in the U.S. The the Mao and Markets book also really, I think, challenge tries to challenge economic thinking in that um, you know sort of communism and markets are you know sort of like oil and water, you know. Uh, and I think in the West, we we definitely, I think, have that idea. And when I would take students to China, when I was at HBS, when I was at Cornell, you know, they would say to me, oh, China is not, not a communist country because it is a really economically vibrant country. But I think what, what an issue is that, um, you know, in the West, we, and it's guided U.S. policy for decades. It's why we let China in the WTO said, okay, if markets come, you know, if we open up markets, that will lead to a more liberal um, and more democratic society. That's sort of standard, you know, economic development theory, but that has proven wrong. And I think that we've had a bunch of economic and pol- political missteps as a result of that. So, so really in that book, we try to, uh, you know, describe and articulate this really unique political economy that is developed in China uh, that is very ideologically driven still, but also can be economically uh, successful. So the, you know, it's interesting because this notion, this notion of culture and framing up how we conceive of things like capitalism and and how they get manifested versus just like there's just there's one pure there's just one pure type of it um that sure. right that that's a it, it's a an illuminating um idea and i'm curious is is that when you think about the the biggest misconceptions that we have about china um what what are what are those misconceptions that might result from this kind of idea that we have like capitalism in our in our brain as a pure type? I mean, I think I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think. Um, uh, I mean, like, you know, like everything. I mean, I think that, you know, it's hard to view things from afar, particularly things that are, you know, relatively different. So I think as a researcher, for me, it was really important to try to be on the ground as much as possible there. So between 2010 and 2020, I actually, you know, spent about four years, a little, little less than four years, actually living in China or traveling there. Uh, you know, spent a lot of time trying to learn Chinese. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I think, so I think the the core misconception I think that has created a lot of problems for the U.S. is just this idea that you know it's like the Deng you know Deng Xiaoping who was a leader in China after Mao Zedong that really is credited with um, you know this, this reform and opening was the name of the policy so opening so bringing in global you know business and capital opening part reform you know, actually allowing for market development. And he, uh, he had the saying, uh, you know, doesn't, you know, both the state and the market or excuse me, both planning and the market are tools. So, you know, we, you know, the idea being that, you know, we can run our economy, part of it can be market driven, part of it can be planning driven. And I think that's that's I think a useful insight that actually that's that's the, these 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 are just tools that can be used. And I think in the West we see them as competing and maybe uh, intention, but but this was not the way things were seen uh, in China. And secondly, I think the important aspect of this that I think is also hard a misconception that I think the West has a difficult time understanding is that they are both the 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 plan or state and market or economy are under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so this is a big difference in China that, um, you know, there's, there. it's not a government like we um, see a government with rule of law that, you know, you can have the or president or, or former president can actually be charged and indicted. 
Uh, whereas in China, there is, the system of this party is actually above everything. And so, you know, things like when the TikTok CEO goes and tries to explain that there's laws in China that would prevent them from turning over data to the to the government and you know th that 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 in and of itself is ex it's explaining things in a way that are consistent with US legal standards and norms but those legal standards and norms do not apply in China because actually really the CCP is above the law uh and so um so anyway, so I I found his testimony as an example pretty, you know, I think not very um, accurate as to how the actual system works. Um, so, well, so so the, I I think this there's in, in, when I was reading it, I I, I wrote down, um, you know, if I had to summarize your book, I was I was going to say, you know, the cultural influences. I mean, it seems like you're showing that the cultural influences, the personalities in terms of Mao, the rhetoric, the socialization impacts the functioning of capitalism and the the consequences of how capitalism is expressed in China. Is that right? Is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, de definitely. I think that's that's very accurate. And we um, and I th and I think why that's important. So a, a lot of the academic um, research have done has looked at imprinting uh in in that being people might be from, more familiar with this um from you know Con conrad lorenz you know from their high school biology where you know he and he's a nobel prize winning you know ecologist bioecologist i think would would be the sort of field and he would let these animals you know out of their eggs or you know be born and sort of what happens when the first thing they see is him or a cow versus their you know their their birth uh, birth mother and so uh what he found is that that actually the first thing that geese and ducks see they imprint on is what he called it and that means that they sort of follow would follow him around so this idea that very early experiences are very very influential uh, and, and I've studied this in a lot of different industries, how early historical events end up lasting. And so with the why we examine Mao is that he was the founding chairman of the People's Republic of China and set a lot of the ideological principles, set the culture and set the institutions. And those continue to last. And so when uh, people, are very surprised when the current Chinese uh, dictator, I guess I'll, I'll call him, uh, Xi Jinping, is very hardline and cracks down and very ideological. They're surprised because it's a departure from the Deng Xiaoping reform and opening era. And what our argument would be is that, you know, no, those, those things were always there. Uh, and actually, maybe the Deng Xiaoping era, which includes not just Deng Xiaoping, but then there were leaders Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. You know, that's really where the aberration is. And there's a deep underlying ideology, culture, and institutions that is carried through that hard line, um, that sort of that that hard line ideology, basically. And and so would you. Would you, um, and I think all these ideas then connect to, you know, the other. So the the question that I had about about if that's the kind of some of the central premise is sure is this about is this it about an expression of capitalism or is this about capitalism versus communism? And I think that was one of the kind of the traps. Yeah. I feel like that you sure you you, you showed people. Well, when we we have this view of the USSR and it's this analogy that we use, and it must be like this that we 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 misunderstand what yeah China is actually like, right? And I think um, yeah. So I mean, it's interesting because you know I think part of it is that so you know there's cross cultural psychology work that looks at how you know Westerners focus much more on trying to separate and categorize things. And so like, is it communism? Is it capitalism? Mm. I think this is when my students go to China. This is why it's a challenge. Whereas 
um, you know, and to see like, oh, this, and, and I've, I've, you know, guilty of the same thing too. Uh, you know, this isn't, you know, how could this be economically vibrant because it's, you know, this, you know, so-called communism. Whereas in the the East, things are about much more about the inter interrelationships and connections. Uh, mm -hmm. One quick experiment, you know, sort of experiment that I heard about is parents, they, you know, sort of psychologists studied parenting and for the, 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 uh, in the West, you know, parents would have like a, a doll in a truck and they would talk about, you know, this is a, a doll, you know, you can see his arms, legs as a truck, you know, it has wheels mm -hmm. drive, but whereas the, in the East, it would be much more about how, you know, this, you know, look, this doll could actually be riding in this truck and it, um, you know, people are, you know, driving cars. This is a mat, you know, drastic over the simplification, but hopefully you get the, get the point. And so, so trying to, it sounds like, it sounds, it sounds like Marianne Glenn categorization is what I, what yes, I, right, what, exactly, I, what right. I hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mervyn Roush yeah. is what I hear. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think that the, this sort of ways of categorization vary cross culturally. And so, you know, we, we have our much more likely to categorize things mindset and it makes it harder to understand these other systems and the policies that, that we take, uh, you know, actually may not be appropriate because the system is actually constructed differently. So, um, so would you, would so you, would you, would you say then that would you say that the misconception that we have between these this categorization and seeing it as as being you know communistic and uh it must be like the USSR lead to not only misunderstanding but antipathy that's misguided oh, yeah yeah definitely well i mean I, antipathy it's hard to say um I'll, maybe i'll say a little bit about that in a second but i do i do think that there is this um you know, yeah. So communism, I think, equals the USSR. You know, it was a massively inefficient, collapsed under its own weight, um, you know, system. And yeah, that that is not actually what China is. There's a lot of ways that China both differed that led it to um um you know, sort of avoiding some of the problems the USSR had. But secondly, you know, the problems of the USSR are front and center for the Chinese. So they're making, um, you know, decisions consciously to avoid being like the USSR. So, so I think that, that definitely, um, you know, there, there is, um, like it's, it, we're, our, our categorization process is leading to misunderstand, uh, the Chinese system and, and potentially have antipathy but i i think here you know so my um you know for a lot of that time 2010 2020 when i was spending a lot of time in china i mean i just loved being there i mean the chinese people are amazing uh and like a people in every place you know i mean but i think that in the u.s unfortunately you know i think a lot of it is a political rhetoric um you know, in COVID, uh, that there's been a, a grouping of the Chinese people in with the bad things that the Chinese Communist Party has done and led to a lot of very bad cases of like anti-Asian hate and horrible things against Chinese or ethnically Chinese people, some of which may be born in the US and US citizens. Um, so I think that's maybe where lumping things in ways creates has created some bad situations whereas i mean i think the chinese communist party has been pretty sort of a pretty evil um force in this world but really have a deep respect for and love of the chinese people and i think that you know we need to yeah make sure that we um uh, don't conflate the two well it's 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 interesting because when you hear some of the some of that rhetoric right around around lumping china and this you know competition and communism right. and socialism and fill in the blank it it gets brought in these ways and i it, what i think is interesting is independent of what you think about those views 
I think what your what one thing that your book did I thought was really surprising was that it's it's um and I wrote it down as as the quote we should delegate power from central to local political centralization and economic mm. decentralization right. should coexist as a Mao Zedong quote and to me yep. that was surprising that that's it's it's so could you share a little bit more about sure like that insight yeah no it's really interesting and I think it's um. So, you know, you know, Mao got his success um, in the Chinese Communist Party and ended up leading the Chinese Communist Party because of his success as a military commander uh, through the Chinese Civil War with, with the with the Guomindang, who who eventually went to Taiwan, where you know, in Taiwan is a sort of a separate entity um, uh, now. So. Um, so one of the key philosophies he had, um, which related to his military command, was sort of you know seek truth from facts. He he saw that the need to understand the reality of the situation on the ground, and to do that, you couldn't be, um, you know, dictating the plans from the central office or for, or, or central command or some other place. You need to actually be able to delegate the decision making to the local commanders along with that though is the importance of sort of the political uh, ha having those commanders be bought into the political and ideological system so work very hard on ideological commitment but actually left a lot of the um decision making to the local commanders when the, the people's republic of china was was, a, was um was established a lot of those military commanders ended up becoming you know governors mayors uh and a lot of the similar political structures ended up being adopted actually you know a lot of the structure you know, sort of structures in the military end up being adopted in uh politically uh sort of to, to manage the you know china's large land area so this that this allowed china to have a degree of flexibility and be able to do local experimentation people might be familiar with these uh special economic zones which you know china was able to you know say okay shenzhen or zhuhai which is across from macau or some other areas where, okay, we're just going to allow capitalism. We're going to see what happens, you know, if we sort of open up markets and the, the things can be sort of self-contained. Whereas the Soviet Union, the economy was much more economically centralized. So you had, you know, this industry, you know, located in this, um, you know, the, the Soviet equivalent of prov province, uh, or state, and so things things were much more run from the central, uh, for, from Moscow basically, uh, and that made it much harder to reform through piecemeal geographic experimentation, uh, which which was a big success. Uh, one of the factors that I think has led China to be a, have a tremendously economic success over the last forty years. It's a uh... It, yeah, that was a, a surprising, you know, piece of this. Um, I, I thought one of the other interesting pieces that you you got to was um, the, the ways, it's just the broader the broader concept of of imprinting and and using that to explain these these kind of cycles of economic development in China, and you chronicle those those you know three stages. What and, and the implications then for entrepreneurship, sure. business performance, um, you know, the the notion of more more companies founded during difficult times uh as a result of some of the the hardship that the system put in place, sure. um, the frugality. Uh so right. this whole this whole imprinting idea and it, it operating through all these mechanisms, whether it's rhetoric or it's the the CCP branches that that are there in society. Um, can you talk a little right. bit more about uh, maybe for someone who hasn't read the book, but at a high level, how you see this concept of imprinting shaping how China became what it is today? Yeah. Sure. So um, I guess I'll just start very, very, you know, so 
know, if you think about this idea, and we have it in the U.S., you know, sort of the so-called founding fathers, and you know, much of the, you know, decentralized nature of the financial service institution. People say, oh, this is, you know, Thomas Jefferson wanted to have things very locally based, and then you had Alexander Hamilton as sort of the counterweight, wanting much more centralized, and. You know, there's work on imprinting looking in France and how some of the early kings ended up sort of imprinting of different social political structures that get sort of spilled down over time. Uh, so the thing that's interesting, I think, in thinking about China is so so these these, you know, sort of ideas of early leaders having a lasting influence. People sort of can understand this, but one of the things that we were able to trace in the book is connect the dots a little bit on both the ideological and the institutional uh, system um, ways of that these um, that these aspects get passed down over time. So it's not just, you know, you were born in Mao's time and and you know you sort of heard him on the radio and you had a red book. But then, you know, that basically dies with you. Uh, so, how do these things continue to to last? You know, actually, one of the thing, one of the ask, one of the thing experiences I had that really got me thinking about the lasting influence of Mao and and see in the Chinese Communist Party how they actually indoctrinate people into that was when I was at Cornell and I was on on an admissions panel and. You know, I, I can I can read Chinese a bit, and so I was scrolling through an applicant's file uh, for a PhD and a PhD student, and saw jumped off the page at me once was Mao the Mao Zedong's name basically. I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. And you know, I learned Chinese when I was late, so it's not like I can, I can skim things very fast in English. But so I'm like, sort of want to look very carefully and see, you know, what is what is this? And it's, it's actually was Mao Zedong theory. Uh, or Mao Zedong thinking, and the student had taken two of these classes, um, um, and they were both required. Uh, and I and that's really interesting. I looked at the English, you know, because Chinese universities provide an English translation of the, you know, sort of an official English version of the transcript, also in addition to a Chinese one. Uh, and actually, that was translated as Chinese philosophy uh, in the English translation. Uh, and this is sort of, I think, like the TikTok CEOs. Um, yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of testimony and talking about the Chinese laws. I mean, th they're presenting things in a way in English or in, you know, that fit into our, that, you know, or in some ways true and, and fit into our mindsets of what is acceptable, uh, but really mask the, what is the core underlying element. So anyways, uh, so the, the, these, this student and all Chinese students through college take, it might be Xi Jinping thought now, uh, I'm sure probably it had a lot of Xi Jinping thought um, mm -hmm. in it in, 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 in at the time, you know, ideology classes through their entire schooling. Uh, so this is one aspect of how, you know, this, uh, these ideas can continue to be indoctrinated, you know, 2021 when I, I mean, I'd finished the book or we had finished the book, um, you know, the book was with my co-author Kunyan, uh, Kunyan Chow, former student of mine from, uh, from Cornell. And the Chinese Communist Party was celebrating its centenary. And so they were promoting all these revolutionary movies, encouraging red tourism where people, you know, you know, are, are encouraged to travel to spots where, you know, Mao Zedong held this conference or, you know, Mao Zedong's hometown, which I've also been to, um, you know, other things. You know, there's a lot of these ways that actually these ideas and culture get perpetuated, even through official histories. You know, in China, there's this concept called historical nihilism. Is, is this is what I was just going to ask you about. Uh, and basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah, historical nihilism. So uh, basically, because it, is it is it? Would you? So, and sorry to sorry to an sorry individual. To, no, sorry, sorry to, to sure, no, no, go you, but yeah. but yeah. Because the, the, you you went right to where I was I was going to go because I said you know it's this notion of like well, it it works it, you know the imprinting mechanism is so much about history, and and remembering the the past at yeah. the past as as a source of legitimation, 
And, you know, it raises all these like super interesting questions about, you know, what it takes, you know, it, how much work has to happen for history to be preserved and, and what that looks yep. like in China and what that looks like in the West. Um, and how these, you know, one is a static notion of history that feels like it's, it's set, it's locked. And now there seems like to be in the West, there's more of this, um, there's a, there's a move towards a revisionist or even a forgetting maybe, you know, not in both there's, you know, different views on that. So I'd love for you to, say, to talk more about that concept and how that yeah. impacted China. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, um, to think about sort of contrasting the West and China on that. I mean, clearly, you know, history is in some ways a living, you know, living document, uh, so to speak. I mean, as you get some perspective, maybe have a better understanding as conditions change, maybe you can reassess things that happened earlier. But I'm talking about the West. I mean, the West is a much more, I don't know, sort of bottoms up, uh, you know, People are struggling with it, scholars, public intellectuals. Um, um, and the, po the politics, I guess, is somewhat getting into it because, you know, there's there's a variety of, um, you know, so, so, you know, in U.S. state level where like very, you know, the people are saying, oh, we, we, we're not going to talk about this, this or that subject. Um, in China, I think it's really a much more stronger top-down approach and this uh, historical nihilism what it is basically is that the, i mean there is an there is officially there's official history in china constructed by the chinese communist party so when they um had their centenary they came out with the you know new history and basically you know minimizes the negatives which are historically documented, you know, overemphasizes, you know, the positives, overemphasizes the role of Xi Jinping. Uh, and if you contradict as, or go against this, you can be basically thrown in jail. Um, and so, you know, this is, I think, a sort of autocratic um, country you know, uses propaganda and uses control of history in a way to, you know, help legitimize and, and maintain its rule. Uh, in the U.S., you know, I mean, there's a lots of debates around history, mm -hmm. but at least, you know, and some of them are heated, uh, but at least, you know, we can actually have those debates and we can maybe disagree on things uh, maybe heatedly and some people probably hate each other and, and, and think that people are, driving in America in the wrong place, you know, you know, whatever of the many, many sides one and beyond, but at least, you know, we can have that discussion in China, you know, there is actually an official history and you can be, you know, not just that ostracized or hated, but you can actually literally be thrown in jail for going against the official history. Okay. You know, it's like, it, it, it makes you more, at least in my case, it makes me more proud to be an American where you you can have you can you can either say the past was not appreciated the way it needs to be or you can say we need to stop teaching the past or we should teach more of the right. past and everybody can have their different point of view but at least it's not that there is there are places where the i mean I, the, the official history uh is yeah. shared which is i mean fascinating yeah no and i think you know my my my, my experience both in China and in the U.S., uh, excuse me, in China and in, in, in the U.K., you know, I mean, every country has its positives and negatives. Mm. Um, and I guess maybe we're all sort of um, attract, you know, sort of have deep attraction to the place where we grew up and know very well. Um, but I, but I also come away the sort of um, American spirit can do spirit which i think resonates in china too but then also i think the freedom and discourse really enables innovation in ways that although a lot of chinese companies have been very innovative and china has this incredible culture and um 
and the people are very warm and kind and and um but i do think that the 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 the, the current regime uh is is limiting the you know limiting china basically um so so that's a, uh, that was uh, your take you're going right to where I, I i'm going next um so good. it was to that to that to that question which so is sign like, of a good interviewer you got to get, get people to yeah. <laughs> you're going right you're well, I, i'm not even anticipating it but it, it's 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 fun so yeah. I, how do you how do you sure. view then the question of how so you know the notion that there is a there is there are positive i mean there are positives that have come out of China's rise and it's, 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 it's success is, is just an empirical fact. And, you know, the, the, the notion that that system is a hundred percent perfect is, is, is not correct. Um, you know, and to your point about, you know, every system has its, has its downsides. Um, and there are, there are, there are trade-offs and, um, you know, certainly the, the system in the West has worked in the United States in particular has worked unbelievably well. So, how do you then forecast the future on on the model that China has put in place? If we think about you know three cycles beyond where your book ends and three cycles for the United States, wh- wh- how do you see this playing out over the next you know 10, 20 years? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's it's. I mean, there's so much geopolitical tension. I mean, I worry sometimes that sort of bad things, uh, you know, some like really negative event would happen um, that brings a little bit more, you know, you know, conflict maybe over Taiwan or something. Which I think, you know, I never would have thought. I mean, I spent time in Taiwan. I just was in Taiwan earlier this year, in January. Never, you know, uh, but I do think that you could see things spiraling out of control in ways that had not. Um, happened before. So that aside, let's say things just keep going um, like they go. I mean, I, uh, my experience, again, maybe biased from growing up in the US, uh, that to have real breakthrough uh, innovations and advancements requires friction. And it requires Mm. lots of experimentation and, and almost like a natural selection type of process. And you can see that happening, you know, you know, through, you know, many examples in the US and in China for a long time, you know, there was a lot the the technology um, companies had a lot more freedom and did tons of very um, innovative things. I mean, you know, like 5G, you know, Huawei, which is reviled, um, you know, in the US, um, you know, basically innovated a lot of the you know underlying technology in 5G. Um, you know, a lot of the fintech, um, you know, e-commerce advancements that many of the companies like Alibaba and Tencent and um, you know others have done have been just really you know very revolutionary. Uh, but I do think that the really strong hand that the the Chinese Communist Party has taken in the last number of years on those companies. You know, you have entrepreneurs and leading venture capitalists uh, or financiers disappearing. Um, you have companies, IPOs being canceled for like like that, uh, or be, having their international listing uh, yanked, forced splitting up. Uh, of companies, you have this phenomenon now called golden sh- golden shares. Uh, I guess it's not totally new phenomena, but it's sort of being used in a much more uh, extensive way, where you know the government and CCP can gain very small equity stakes, about one one percent. Uh, they get board seats, and they get also uh, basically veto power over key key decisions. Party branches, which which you mentioned, where you know there's in many companies now sort of a shadow, in some ways, authority structure uh, that reports into the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, All of these things, I think, detract from the innovation environment in China. And, you know, there's all this then spending on, you know, on innovation. uh, and and, And in a lot of the cases, it end up being a lot of corruption and wasted money. And 
and focus on outputs like patents, which are certainly important. But if your out if your output is number of patents, I mean, there's a lot of ways to actually have a high number of patents and actually not have real innovation. And I think there's been a lot of examples where that's that's happened. So, so, and I think that for I mean, we're in a technology age right now. To continue growing economically requires innovations, and I think you know, you know, up until you know five ten years ago, China was on a really good trajectory. Uh, around that where you know early days there was a lot of joint ventures you know there was a lot of you know you know ip there's definitely a lot of ip issues with chinese take you know sort of copying um you know either illegally the ip or sort of you know sort of copying maybe not in a legal way but but still copying to, to generating a real truly innovative um you know technology industry uh, and I think that's, you know, maybe has peaked. And I think that this real strict control of the government will probably um, limit that in the coming years. So that was one one uh, connection to that was the the role then of uh, Xi Jinping in, in this next trajectory. It seems like he's positioned as yep. as a, a, a Mao 2.0 in terms of taking core principles, I mean, I don't know if it, it seems like it would become a, a to your point about the the cultural education in schools that it would be less of maybe even Mao's name versus a uh, Xi Jinping. Is that is is that that what you anticipate the leadership structure to be like? I mean, the, 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 I mean that 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 has happened. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways in which Mao and Xi are different, certainly. So I don't want to, you know, people, you know. Yeah, people get really sort of worked up about this Mao and Xi comparison, so I, I don't want to, you know, over overplay it. Uh, but yeah, there's been, um, yeah, Xi Jinping thought, you know, there there was this uh, this app that was basically mandatory for people to study, actually designed, I'm pretty sure, by Alibaba, which was basically, you know, studying Xi Jinping thought. Uh, there, there is. I mean, everything is um, justified based on Xi Jinping thought. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point where people are carrying around sort of the red book, um, you know, and sort of, you know, raising it. Part of it is, you know, Xi Jinping is actually written. I mean, he's probably the most prolific author in the world, is my guess. I mean, he's written hundreds. I mean, he has not written them, but his name appears on them. You know, hundreds of books, um, probably mandatory to purchase. Um, uh, you know, might be he said literally, literally, literally might be the most the highest selling author uh, in in the world today with all this Xi Jinping thought on X, Y, and Z, and yeah, so it it has really gotten pretty extreme how you know the sort of how strong the ideological control is and you know the centrality of Xi Jinping um, in his you know. And Xi Jinping thought, so to, as it's called, uh, to that. You know, it's, it's an interesting notion of of innovation, and use the word friction as you know, connect and a connecting idea. And I think there's times when you can look at so much of what's. I was talking to my wife about this the other day. It's just like everything feels like it's changing. It's yeah. It's you know, it's not Google. It's Chat GPT. It's not you know. It's not PGA Tour golf. It's live golf. It's not. I mean, it's just right. pick your pick your domain of life, and it's uh, evolving so rapidly. Uh, but and and that comes with friction and and challenge yeah. and pain. But it's adaptive. Uh, it, you know, it seems like what you're saying is we we by 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 encouraging that we still have you know the, with innovation with free speech we have the ability then to be those be those folks that buck the norms, which is what yep. What what your 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 core interest is, right? Yeah. So exactly. if if you would if you maybe close this out with what would be the the some of the core implications you'd have for um, you know business leaders who are are considering China? You you lay out several in the book about where to invest, sure. how to invest, um, uh, some things around principles to keep in mind in terms of an engagement. What would be some of those things you'd want to call attention to? Sure. I mean, I, I think that so 
One is is just the absolute centrality of the party and government. And I think that this is sort of an obvious thing. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind because even companies that actually do very well in China forget it. You know, the, I, uh, one of the visits I did with uh, with my students was to the NBA. And it was after they had this uh, sort of scandal where they, you know, were sort of taken off air because one of their, you know, uh, general managers of Houston Rockets tweeted in support of the uh, pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. And I so we asked the, the our, our host, who is one of the senior executives of the NBA in China, and he said, you know, he said, it sounds so silly, but we just, we really should have worked harder on our government relations. Mm. And he said, the reason why is that we were sort of caught by this blindsided and we didn't know what to do. And there was no one that we could really reach out to, to understand how to actually deal with the situation. So that that's one thing. I think also um, the importance of relationships more generally you know, in the U.S. Uh, and West, you know, we think of business deals much more in terms of like contracts and what the conditions are. Uh, but in China, you know, it's much more about getting, you know, you know, getting to know your counterpart and developing those deeper relationships is something that's even more important than the terms of of the contract. Um, yeah. You know, those are a couple that, that that stand out to me. Also, I think, you know, China is a very diverse place. And a lot of, you know, I was going to say this, you asked me about misconceptions. You know, there, you know, you know, China is a vast land area, you know, about the same size as the United States. Um, and, you know, there's been people for thousands of years on that land area. And so, you know, there's very different cultures, norms, languages. I mean, like the Chinese, actually, what is spoken in China is as diverse as what is spoken in Europe. Uh, I mean, it has all say, all the same written script, but but actually, the spoken languages from you know the South by Hong Kong to to Shanghai, you know, to various places in the West of China, you know, they they speak very different languages, and so I think that under understanding in, in the regional. And cultural diversity within China is is also something that's really important if you're going to be doing business to, you know, be, you, know you can't just g go in and do the same thing everywhere. I mean, you need to actually, you know, do different things in different places. Well, <clears throat> Chris, it, it was great uh, to, to talk to you about and, and learn from you, really, the I think the book is just absolutely amazing because it it combines social science with some some actual like tests that you ran and data that you actually collected and people you talked to, you know, with history, with you know, just so many different lenses to kind of understand what what it, it is. It seems like too much a a singular idea that's in in wherever in in you know discourse that is just flawed or short-sighted or misunderstood in so many ways. So your book is really impressive. Um, and it was great to spend time chatting with you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Doug. It was great to be on your show and uh, really enjoyed our discussion.